Okay, now let's talk about gonadal and anatomical sexual differentiation. So when I talk about gona gonadal, gonadal sex, I mean what kind of gonads do we have? The most usual variations are testes, which are most, mostly associated with male, and ovaries, which are mostly associated with female. These gonads produce our gametes, sperm or eggs. They also produce a lot of the important hormones that guide both sexual differentiation during development of the embryo and other development of sexual both characteristics and even behavior during the or rest of the organism's life. So these are both sources of gametes and important sources of hormones. They're important glands. And then we can all, we are also going to talk about anatomical sex, which is both the external genitalia, whether an individual has penis and scrotum, or labia majora, minora, and clitoris, or there are some intersex variations, which we will, which we will talk about. <clears throat> also, internal structures. That would be things like a uterus, fallop a uterus fallopian tubes and inner vagina, or a vas deferens and seminal vesicles and epididymis, for tip that's the typical male pattern. Or again, sometimes you have something not quite one or the other, or sometimes even very, very rarely both. And then, ha so those, well, we'll t the issue of psychological sex, we're going to get to that. But let's talk about how these things develop bait and how that is affected by chromosomal sex. So what I'm going to go over first is the most, are the most typical patterns, and then we'll get into the intersex variations. So let's start before birth. So way, way back. So before about six weeks, of gestation. So, before about six weeks gestation, an embryo, it already has a chromosomal sex. That happens at the moment of fertilization. But up to this point, it really has no gonadal or anatomical sex, both XX, XY, or other variations on embryos. They have what we call bipotential gonads. and ambiguous genitalia. That's the external genitalia. It also has two sets of internal ducts. Uh, these are often called the Mullerian, which are also known as the paramesonephric. ducts, and the Wolfian, also known as just the mesonephric ducts. So we've got these bipotential gonads, which are neither, which are not testes or ovaries, but have the potential to be either. We have ambiguous ge external genitalia, something that is not really the male or the female pattern yet. And we have two sets of internal tubes one set that we call the Mullerian ducts, another set we call the Wolfian ducts. But all embryos have these early on. How they develop is the question of sexual determination. So let's talk about how that works. So first thing, around six weeks, first thing that happens is the gonads start to differentiate these bipotential gonads will become either ovaries or testes, usually. Now, in the absence of any other signal, these bipotential gonads will become ovaries. If you don't do anything to do anything to cause a difference, 
they will develop as ovaries. And this kind of starts a process which you'll see over and over in this sexual differentiation idea. The default course for body development is female. It, that in order for a body to be develop, to develop as male, you have to intervene. There are signals that tell it, don't become female, instead go, become male. But usually in the absence of those signals, the body becomes female. In a way, the default body plan is female. Um, I remember sometimes when younger, sometimes guys wonder, why do I have nipples? I don't nurse children. And the answer is because the default body plan is female and you masculinize it if you're going to become male. But if you don't do otherwise, the basic idea is female. So anyway, back to this. The default pattern is for gonads to become ovaries. But in the presence of the SRY gene on that Y chromosome, if you have a Y chromosome with an SRY gene, that SRY gene produces a protein which causes a difference in how the gonads develop, and instead they become testes rather than ovaries. So it's at the first place, it's the presence of that SRY gene and its product. So keep that in mind. That's important to, that's important to know that that's the first step. That does, that's what causes gonadal differentiation, which starts around six weeks. Now, after that, the products of the gonads are going to affect the development of the rest of the stuff. So I'm going to erase this and bring this back up to the top here. So if I have ovaries, the default pattern is that the Mullerian ducts become the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the upper about third of the vagina. Now this is actually a good point to mention for a moment here. Uh, the word vagina is often used incorrectly. Uh, sometimes people when they're referring to a female external genitalia, they'll say, oh, that the vagina. That is not correct. The vagina is the tube which goes from the outside to the cervix and the uterus. The, it's the birth canal where babies come from the uterus out through. And if one chooses to engage in such, it's where the penis goes in in, um, penet in penetrative intercourse that can result in fertilization or other things. Anyway. Um, we're not, yeah. So, the proper term for the general external genitalia on a female is vulva, not vagina. So when I say the upper vagina, I mean the upper part of that birth canal up near the cervix. Okay. And the Wolfian ducts degenerate and disappear. So, the default pattern, if you have ovaries, is that the Mullerian ducts become these internal female structures and the Wolfian ducts go away. If you have testes though, those testes produce two distinctive hormones at this point. One of them is called anti-Mullerian hormone. This causes the Mullerian ducts to degenerate. The other is testosterone. This causes the Wolfian ducts to become the vas deferens, which is the tube which carries sperm from the epididymis, uh, which is on the testes, it up to the prostate and joins up with the urethra. So that's how sperm come out from the testes into the urethra where they can be ejaculated. So the vas deferens, the epididymis, which is the sperm storage tube on the testes, and the seminal vesicles, which produce some of the components of semen. So 
Here's where the internal structure differentiation happens. If you have in if you don't do anything else, then the Mullerian ducts become an become a uterus fallopian tubes and the upper part of the vagina, the uterus being the womb where you gestate children, the fallopian tubes being the tubes that can go from the uterus toward the ovaries and bring ovulated eggs to the uterus. But if you have testes, those testes produce anti-Mullerian hormone, which makes the Mullerian ducts degenerate, and testosterone, which causes the Wolfian ducts, rather than degenerating, to become the internal male structures, the epididymis, which stores sperm on the testes, the vas deferens, which carries those sperm up, and the seminal vesicles, which add to some components to the semen during ejaculation. So those are where the internal structures come from. And again, it's the signal, it's a special signal which causes us to go from the default pattern to the male pattern. So that's the internal differentiation. Now let's talk about the external genital differentiation. So those ambiguous genitalia, let me start by making clear what those look like. The ambiguous genitalia that you start with, we call these the labioscrotal swellings. I'll erase this stuff too. Give myself a little more room. This up here is the genital tubercle. And these are the urethral folds. Both XX and XY uh, embryos have these. This differentiation is actually going to start around eight weeks. Up until about eight weeks, this is what we've got. And over the next couple weeks after that, Depending on what's happened with the chromosomal and gonadal sex, these will develop generally one way or the other, although we'll get to, again, later, a little bit about how this can sometimes go differently. So, <clears throat> everyone starts with these sets of structures. In the absence of any other signal, again, the default pattern is that the genital tubercle becomes the clitoris, the labioscrotal swellings become the labia majora, the outer lips of the vulva, and the urethral folds become the labia minora, the inner lips, and the lower vagina, which then connects to the upper vagina that came from the Mullerian ducts. So in the absence of any other signal, we end up with labia majora, minora, and the clitoris here. However, if you have testes that are producing testosterone, and especially, let me make a note here of the what can happen here. If we have testes that are producing testosterone, That testosterone usually, some of it gets converted by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase into a version called dihydrotestosterone. And testosterone can have an effect on these, but dihydrotestosterone has a much, much stronger effect. So usually, you have to have this to cause the change of these into the male version of the genitals, or at least to cause the full transformation. In the presence of dihydrotestosterone, the labioscrotal swellings become the scrotum, the urethral folds become the shaft of the penis, and the genital tubercle 
becomes the head of the penis. This is one of the reasons when we talk about external genitalia between the typical female and typical male versions, we talk about them being homologous, which is a way of saying they came from the same original structures. The same structure will become either the clitoris or the head of the penis. The same structure will become either the scrotum or the labia majora. So they come from the same place, unlike the internal structures, where they come from completely different uh, sets of ducts, Mullerian or Wolfian ducts. So external genital differentiation comes from the presence or absence of testosterone and especially dihydrotestosterone. Keep this enzyme in mind. You're going to need to know about it in a little bit. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's... Talk, let's talk for a moment here about, this is the most typical pattern. Let's talk for a moment about how it sometimes comes out differently. Before we go on, I wanted to very quickly lay out sort of what we just talked about in a possibly kind of confusing form. I've never tried to do it this way, so let's see if we can make this work. So talking about several layers of sex differentiation, chromosomal, gonadal, internal ducts, and external genitalia, what I've got here is that gonads will become ovaries unless there is an SRY gene which causes them to become testes. The Mullerian ducts will become the uterus, fallopian tube, and vagina, and the Wolfian ducts will degenerate unless there are testes which produce anti-Mullerian hormone, which causes the Mullerian ducts to degenerate, and testosterone, which causes the Wolfian ducts to become epididymis, vas deferens, and seminal vesicles. The external genitalia will become the labia majora, labia minora, and the lower, and the lower vagina, unless there are testes producing testosterone, which gets converted to DHT, which then causes them to become penis and scrotum. So, you may want to refer back to this. You might take a picture of this and refer back to it as we talk about the next part of intersex conditions, because it might make it easier to see how sometimes these things come out a little differently. All right, let's talk about intersex conditions. These are the atypical arrangements of those four layers of sex, sex differentiation. Uh, this is any combination of chromosomal, hormonal, or anatomical arrangement which puts a person somewhere that is not on that binary idea between the female alignment and the male alignment. Let me emphasize again that these are atypical, but not abnormal. Many of these are normal variations. They're just unusual. So let's start with chromosomal. Most of these come out, well, here, let me talk about a couple that aren't. There's, in some cases, what you get is an absent SRY. So you have a Y chromosome that lacks the SRY gene. The absence of the SRY, so you have an individual who's XY but does not have a Y chromosome in the SRY, means that the gonads do not develop into testes. However, because of that particular arrangement, they also don't develop into ovaries the way you would normally expect. And you end up with something called Swire syndrome. In Swire syndrome, the person will develop the internal structures. The Mullerian ducts do become uh, uterus and ovaries, but the gonads do not become normal over. Sorry, uterus and fallopian tubes, but the gonads do not become normal ovaries. Instead, you end up with what are called streak gonads, which are sort of undifferentiated. And those can cause serious problems since they don't really make any sex hormones. They also have some other issues. Which, Since you don't have testosterone or the estrogens and progesterones from, what, from either ovaries or testes, the individual does not usually develop a lot of secondary sex characteristics at puberty. They'll have female external genitalia when they're born, but during puberty they do not produce, they do not develop breast, hip development, very much, if any, pubic hair. And that's at the, which point this, it is often realized what the issue is here. So that's one kind of intersex condition. Another is when you can have an SRY attached to an X chromosome. 
In the condition where the SRY gene becomes attached to an X chromosome, you can have an individual who, is, who has XX chromosomes, but one of them has an attached SRY, which causes testicular development. And those testicles typically produce testosterone and dihydrotestosterone and antimullerian hormone. So the person develops physically male, actually fairly typically male. Sometimes there are some minor differences. Uh, for example, sometimes the testes don't descend uh, when they should, but and usually the person is less fertile, but it is the generally this person has both has a male body and usually a male gender identity. So those are two of the unusual chromosomal arrangements. Another kind of chromosomal arrangement that can produce intersex conditions are what are called aneuploidies. An aneuploidy is when you have some number of copies of a chromosome other than two. The most common aneuploidy people are familiar with is trisomy 21, when you have three copies of chromosome number 21. And that produces Down syndrome. There are some others. Um, trisomy 18 produces Edwards syndrome, I believe, and trisomy 13 produces Patau syndrome. Edwards syndrome is almost always fatal, and those who are born generally die within the first weeks. Uh, Patau syndrome, some, rarely people can live through childhood. As far as I know, all other trisomies are fatal, usually very early in development. Usually the embryo fails to develop very early. Oftentimes the person carrying it doesn't even know they were pregnant. But aneuploidies in sex chromosomes are a lot less dangerous um, for a reason we'll get to. But let's talk about how that can work. So you can have XO, which is when a person has one X chromosome and no other chromosome. They don't have a second X or a Y. This produces something called Turner syndrome. So in Turner syndrome, individuals, since they don't have the SRY, they develop ovaries and they develop internal female structures, uterus, fallopian tubes, and vagina, and exter external genitalia are female. But these individuals usually don't menstruate um, without hormone therapy. And when they, when they hit puberty, Generally, they do not um, develop female secondary sex characteristics. There are also some uh, typical uh, physical characteristics. Often individuals with Turner have a little bit of webbing at their neck. Uh, they're typically short and they have some differences in their heart and sometimes their hands and feet. Uh, if these individuals receive hormone replacement therapy because their gonads are not producing the hormones you would normally expect, they can then undergo a more typical pubertal development as female. Most individuals with Turner syndrome have female gender identity, um, and pe people with Turners are women as a rule. General, usually less fertile though. Uh, generally intelligence is normal in individuals with Turner syndrome. Some of them have some problems with um, spatial reasoning. Okay, another aneuploidy is XXY, when an individual has two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. Now think for a moment, what's the likely physical development of a person with this? So if they have the Y chromosome with an SRY gene, the presence of the SRY causes the early gonads to become testes. The testes produce antimullerian hormone and testosterone, so the internal duct, the mullerians degenerate and the Wolfian ducts become epididymis, vas deferens, and seminal vesicles. They produce dihydrotestosterone, so they develop male external genitalia. These individuals have what's called Klinefelter syndrome. Individuals with Klinefelter syndrome uh, are male. Before puberty, it's, you often can't really tell uh, a, an individual with Klinefelters. They tend to be tall, they tend to have less body hair, and they tend to be, maybe have a little bit less muscle development. At puberty, depending on the individual, you tend to see some particular symptoms. Some people with Klinefelters, there's no obvious way to tell. But in some individuals, they tend to get some level of breast and hip development, uh, generally more body fat deposition, especially at the hips. They often have um, less body hair. They do tend to be tall. They tend to get less muscle development, less um, broadening of the shoulders. Most individuals with, with Klinefelters identify as male and present as male, but it is considered an intersex condition. 
Individuals with Kleinfelters usually have normal intelligence and have limited fertility. Some individuals with Kleinfelters um, are fertile, some are not. Some many have problems with fertility. Uh, intelligence is normal. Some individuals with Kleinfelters have some problems with reading, uh, but, in, but in general, intelligence is normal. Okay, it's also possible to have three X chromosomes, what's called triple X syndrome. Although it's not usually considered a syndrome because really triple X has no particular symptoms. Uh, individuals with triple X, since they lack the SRY gene, they develop as female to completely phenotypically normal female. They tend to be tall. Uh, their eyes tend to be slightly wide spaced, but most individuals with triple X don't know they have it because there's no particular problem with it. Individuals with triple X are usually fertile. Uh, there's also XYY, which also is effectively asymptomatic. Uh, individuals with an X and two Y chromosomes really don't have any particular syndrome. There's no particular symptom with this, and most individuals don't know they have it. There was a, I think it was Alien 3, that took place on a planet supposedly where all, all the violent criminals there had two Y chromosomes. Uh, and for a while, people actually thought that having two Y chromosomes made people more inclined to be violent and criminal. I guess the stereotypical thought being they're males except more so, but that's nonsense. And it's not true. Studies of, studies of XYY individuals have found no particular psychological change. So neither of these has any particular phenotype other than maybe some very minor variations. Most people don't, don't know that they are one of these, if they are. So why is it that having three X chromosomes has effectively no sim symptoms, but having three chromosome 21s produces Down syndrome and three of most others is immediately fatal? As it turns out, there's an interesting phenomenon called X inactivation, sometimes known as lionization. In any cell that has more than one X chromosome, all but one of the X chromosomes will go through this process where they condense and become mostly inactive. Only a small percentage, uh, 10 or 20 percent of the genes on that X chromosome continue to be used at all. Most of them become completely inactive. So if you've got an individual who is triple X, two of those X chromosomes will condense, leaving you with just one functional one and two only slightly functional ones. In an individual who is XX, one of those two X chromosomes will condense, leaving you with one X chromosome that's functional and one which is only slightly functional. So the difference between an XX and a triple X is not huge because all but one of those X chromosomes inactivates anyway. Klein, in Kleinfelters, one of those X chromosomes inactivates. So you're left with a person who is XY and then a slightly functional extra X, which is what produces some of the effects of Kleinfelter syndrome. One interesting thing about that is that that inactivation happens at a stage in the embryo called gastrulation, which is very, very early on in embryonic development. And it happens randomly in each cell. So which X chromosome inactivates is different in different cells. What that means is that in any individual with more than one X chromosome, which X chromosome is active at different places in your body is not always the same. So you end up with this condition called mosaicism, where some X, a different X chromosome is active in different cells. In, in general, that produces no particular effect, although if you have certain unusual variations in genes on the X chromosome, you can get a few interesting things from that. Uh, but this is, for example, why calico cats have the hair pattern they do, because in the, one of their genes for hair color is on the X chromosome, and if you have two different ones, then which X chromosome gets inactivated can produce different effects depending on where in the body you are. Kind of an interesting thing. All right. Now, there, we're going to go through some other uh, intersex conditions that are at levels higher than chromosomal. All right, let's talk about a couple of other intersex conditions. So there's three others I want to talk about. The first one is androgen insensitivity.
This is a condition where you have a mutant androgen receptor. Androgen refers to testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, both of which use the same receptor. So if, you're, if the receptor for testosterone and dihydrotestosterone is either partially working or not working, then you end up with some interesting effects. So this is mostly only an issue in XY individuals. In XX individuals, this has, well, actually it's extremely rare because, no, never mind. But in XY individuals, you have, the, you have an SRY gene. So assuming that's functional, that causes the, the gonads to develop into testes. And those testes will produce anti-Mullerian hormone. So that causes the Mullerian ducts to degenerate. which means the individual does not get an, a uterus or fallopian tubes. However, even though the testes are producing testosterone, that testosterone has limited effect. So it may or may not be able to cause the Wolfian ducts to develop, depending on how, how impaired the receptor is. If the receptor is completely non-functional, then the Wolfian ducts will also degenerate because they can't detect the testosterone that would cause them to develop. So the person gets no internal structures, no internal structures of any sort. They don't get uterus and fallopian tubes or vas deferens and epididymis and seminal vesicles. If it's partially functional, it depends on how functional it is, how likely it is that those Wolfian ducts are to mature. But then also the testes, while they are producing testosterone and that's getting converted to dihydrotestosterone, it can't affect the genitalia the same way because the receptor is has a problem. So if you have a, there's several versions of this. You can have what's called mild androgen insensitivity syndrome. And in mild androgen insensitivity, generally the person develops as male with possibly a few minor changes in their genitalia. This is what you get when you have a mostly functional receptor with just maybe doesn't quite work as well. So this produces pretty much male development. you can have what's called partial androgen insensitive syndrome when the receptor is significantly impaired but somewhat functional. In that case, you get testes and you get intersex genitalia. Intersex genitalia means that those external genitalia don't become clearly either masculine or feminine rather than becoming labia and clitoris or penis and scrotum, you end up with something somewhere in between where those, the labioscrotal swellings have maybe moved part way down to becoming a scrotum, but maybe not fused completely. And the genital tubercle has enlarged somewhat, but not to the size of an actual penis. So you end up with something either mostly male, mostly female, or somewhere in the middle. There's actually a clear scale for, for this. Finally, in this case, you can have what's called complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. In that case, the androgen receptor is non-functional and testosterone and dihydrotestosterone can have no effect. In that case, the individual has testes, but other than that, we'll have female development with no uterus or fallopian tubes. The external genitalia will be female, but the vagina will only go part way up and then just sort of have a dead end because the inner, the upper vagina has to come from the, from the Mullerian ducts and those degenerated in this case. An individual with complete androgen insensitivity is born with female genitalia, generally has female gender identity. Um, but then, and at puberty, they develop breasts and hip development, all the secondary sex characteristics of female development, but they will not menstruate because they have no uterus and no ovaries. So it's only at that point, generally when this person has their first pelvic exam, or they don't menstruate at all and they go to the doctor,
that it's discovered that in fact this person is an XY individual whose body does not respond to uh, androgens at all. Most individuals with complete insensitivity have female gender identity and live as females because they are women. People with mild androgen sensitivity usually have male gender identity and people with partial, it depends. Sometimes their gender identity is ambiguous, sometimes female, sometimes male. So that's one of, one of the other intersex conditions. Another one is called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. In congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the adrenal gland, the cells of the adrenal cortex are unable to produce enough cortisol. And while cortisol is not part of sex differentiation, what happens in this case is that since what you have is the pituitary producing corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH, which makes the anterior pituitary produce ACTH, which should make the adrenal cortex produce cortisol, which then comes back and feeds back and tells them to stop making ACTH. But if you can't make enough cortisol, you don't get as much of that feedback, and so the pituitary tends to keep putting out more ACTH. When you put out too much ACTH, all of the adrenal cortex overdevelops. It, those cells um, replicate and start doing way too much. Now, one thing the cells of the adrenal cortex can do is produce testosterone. And while they don't normally do that much before birth, in cases of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, they do. So in this case, the adrenal cortex produces testosterone, which will cause a partial masculinization of the genitals. So this is an issue in XX individuals. It affects XY individuals too, but it doesn't affect their sexual differentiation. So in XX individuals, they have, since they don't have an SRY gene, they have internal ovaries, uh, uterus, fallopian tubes, and so on. But the external genitalia, because they're being exposed to large amounts of testosterone when they wouldn't normally be at this early stage of embryonic development, the genitals undergo some level of masculinization, depending on the degree of the problem. Again, you end up with intersex genitalia. something which either which could be either a large clitoris or a small penis and depending on where the labia, how far the labia scrotal swellings go they look either like pretty much like labia majora or pretty much like a scrotum or somewhere in the middle so that's a relatively common cause of intersex genitalia now a third intersex condition has to do with that one thing I told you to keep an eye on. 5-alpha reductase deficiency. So 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme which converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And if you remember, dihydrotestosterone is a much, much more effective agent for masculinizing genitals. So, this mostly affects X, this most, this really only affects XY individuals. But if you have an XY individual with 5 alpha reductase deficiency, the SRY gene means that they develop testes. And those testes produce anti-Mullerian hormone, which causes the Mullerian index to degenerate, so they don't get a uterus. And they can produce testosterone just fine. So the testosterone causes the Wolfian ducts to develop into the internal structures. So they have testes, epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles. But the external genitalia, which mostly depend on dihydrotestosterone, end up somewhere in the intersex spectrum. So you end up, gener fairly often, these end up more on the female side of the intersex spectrum, where you have a clitoris which is enlarged, um, kind of almost kind of like a very small penis. 
The interesting thing about 5-alpha reductase deficiency is that then at puberty, it's unclear exactly how. It may be because the there may be another version of 5-alpha reductase present elsewhere in the body, um, or there may, there may be some 5-alpha reductase present in the testes, but the large amount of testosterone produced during puberty causes a change in, in the external genitalia. So it's normal during puberty for genitalia to change. For males, the penis grows, you grow extra pubic hair, uh, the testes change, that's as a result of the extra testosterone and dihydrotestosterone during puberty. In individuals, in XY individuals with 5-alpha reductase deficiency, while they are born with mostly female genitalia, at puberty those genitalia undergo a masculinization. Generally what happens at puberty is that the clitoris uh, enlarges even more to the point where really it's now more like a small penis. Sometimes the testes will actually descend partway into the ambiguous, the structures which are sort of like a scrotum but are also really more like labia majora. Um, the voice deepens, the person grows muscles in typical male pubertal development. And so this individual undergoes a masculinization at puberty. Now, most individuals with 5-alpha reductase deficiency, while they are born with typically more typically female genitalia, most of them have a masculine gender identity even from birth. And so for some of them, this is more of their body becoming what they thought it was going to be, which is kind of interesting. There's actually another interesting story with There's a village called Las Salinas in the Dominican Republic, a remote village, small population, in which this condition is very is relatively common. Uh, this is a rare condition in most of the world, but for unknown reasons, possibly uh, just having a very few settlers or inbreeding, this condition is relatively common in Las Salinas. So a fair number of people are born there who have female, female or mostly female genitalia, but who believe that they are male, and these indi some of these individuals undergo a masculinization at puberty. It's common enough in that village that it's an accepted thing. They just know that some of these individuals will become males at puberty. Uh, the name they call it is hueva uh, testes at 12, effectively. And those individuals change from having female roles as children to masculine roles after puberty. So they have a whole ritual to accept this process, which is kind of nice in a way. Anyway. So those are the three most common intersex conditions that aren't chromosomally based. Now, in the rest of this, in the next parts of these lectures, we're going to talk about uh, the, more tip the more typical patterns where female, when I talk about female and male, I'm talking about the typical female and typical male patterns in terms of uh, female gametogenesis and the menstrual cycle, how those uh, gametes are prepared and ovulated and then just a little bit about fertilization, um, pregnancy, and even a tiny bit about contraception. So in all of that, we didn't really talk very much about psychological gender identity, and I wanted to make sure we did talk about that, including not in the aspect of intersex conditions. So psychological gender identity, whether a person feels like they are male, female, or something else, some either neither or both or a third gender or something like that, is a really interesting question and it's not something that we know all that much about. There is good evidence that a person's psychological gender identity is shaped strongly by those other aspects of sex differentiation, by chromosomal, gonadal, and an, uh, chromosomal and gonadal anyway, uh, shaped by the hormones that a person's body produces and the hormones they're probably exposed to in utero. Uh, there is pretty good reason to believe that gender identity is largely shaped, uh, if not at latest, by a few years of age, and that it's more or less not changeable after that. However, there is also good reason to think that, that's, that it's not that simple. That for at least some people, gender identity is probably somewhat fluid and is somewhat shaped by what they are told and the expectations of society. So... The, the main issue there is that uh, 
gender identity is at least partially, probably mostly biologically based, but probably not entirely. Probably it is influenced by other things as well. So the, it makes sense that intersex conditions would affect it because in many cases those do affect the production of hormones, which probably influences brain structure, which is probably part of psychological gender identity. But it's not the only factor. So the fact that a person has a typically, say, female uh, bio body development does not mean that they can't have a masculine gender identity or vice versa or identify as neither, as non-binary or something else. And in some of those cases where you have issues of transgender, where a person's psychological identity does not match their physical uh, gender identity, or where their physical gender identity is ambiguous, and then it's hard to say what their psychological gender identity might turn out to be, those are complicated issues. Um, and it interacts interestingly with these intersect conditions. Historically speaking, when a person is born with intersex genitals, the more common practice was to have the doctor or somebody take a look and say, well, it's got to be one or the other, and even surgically alter the genitals to decide, I think this is going to be a male or a female infant. The problem is, with many of those intersex conditions, it's not possible to tell at birth what the person's psychological gender identity is going to be. So if you've surgically assigned them a gender that early and it doesn't match what their psychological identity is, the person can end up with a serious mismatch which causes massive psychological psychological trauma to the individual, as many people modern day know. So the more common practice now is if a person is born with intersex genitalia, it's more common to say, well, unless there is a problem, unless there's a physiological problem here that needs correcting, we're going to leave it alone and wait until later so this person can decide what they think their body should be. And some people with intersex genitalia choose to have them modified to be more masculine or more female, and some people choose to leave them alone, say, oh no, this is what I am. So the take-home message here is that psychological gender identity is influenced by these other aspects, but also by other things. It is very complicated, and there's a lot we do not understand about it. But it is really not questionable that not everyone identifies as the gender they that their body seems to be, and that those differences are real. Gender identity is a real thing, not something that people make up, and needs to be taken into account. Okay, that's all for right now, so I'll see you in the next lecture.